Good morning, everyone. I um, never know how to react to those long introductions, um, but thank you, I think. <laughs> Margot Greenwood, Nitsi Gutsun, I'm Nihio from Treaty 6 territory in what is now known as Alberta. I begin this morning by acknowledging the ancestors and unceded territories of the Treaty 1 peoples and the lands on which we gather as traditional territory of the, of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I thank them, thank you, for allowing me to be here today to speak about our children and our families. I also want to thank the elders for starting us off in a good way. Miigwech. I want to uh, thank the organizers uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share time with you. I would uh, be remiss if I did not acknowledge the pain and grief of your recent loss and of the loss of our young people, Tina Fontaine and Colton Boucher, and the many others who have gone before them. There are no words to say how wrong this is, nor has the need for change ever been greater. I was invited here today to share a few words about early childhood. Your conference theme, Children Embody the Past, Live the Present, and Promise the Future, reminds me of a teaching that I learned from Joanne Archibald. She says that we, have, we reach to the past with one hand to what our grandfathers and grandmothers taught us. And with the other hand, we reach to the future using those teachings to inform us as we live each day and as we look forward to the future. When I was thinking about this presentation, I really reflected back on my own teaching and on the past, um, what I was doing today and where I, I see myself going in the future. And in that, I really reflected on what I've learned about early childhood and the care and education of our children. Talking about children is deeply, deeply personal. And for many of us, it's also professional. It doesn't stop our thoughts about children and how we believe about children. Um, when we go to the workplace or when we go home, they are a part of us. I remember that when I was writing my PhD, I really struggled, really struggled on how to begin. How do I begin writing such a document? And I was writing about children. I was writing about our children in our communities in Canada and in New Zealand. And I really struggled with that. And the way I, my pathway out of that was to begin to write letters, was to begin to write notes to my son. In those notes, I explained to Aaron why I had came, came to be doing a PhD about early childhood. I want to offer you, I'm going to uh, share with you some of those words as a way for you to know me and to know some of the things that I believe are important. And I think you will see that in this presentation as we move through the remainder of it. So please sit back and relax. I'm going to share with you some notes to my son. I am writing this note to you, Aaron, as my eldest son. 
You have always wanted to know more about your roots, about your family, and your history. I am also writing this note to you so that you will understand how I came to be in this place, in this time, doing this work. The journey of writing this dissertation has and continues to strengthen my understanding of myself and the topic I seek to learn about. It is in this relationship of learning that I position myself by writing these notes to you about my learning. I also hope that readers of this dissertation will gain enough information about who I am so that may, they may enter into relationship with me. We may then walk together through written pages describing, questioning, wondering, and learning about the good care of Indigenous children. I've not included my whole life story here, but have chosen those pieces that I think are most relevant. And even as I write these memories, I am cognizant of always being in relationship as I learned and continue to learn from others, like you, Aaron, and the world around me. This concept of relationships permeates my being so that these stories become important in you knowing and understanding my work. They also illustrate my beliefs about reality. We live in a sea of relationships with each other and with the world and all that it is in it. This view of reality then influences me throughout my life, including this study right down to why I chose my question and what I did to learn about it. I will tell you more about this later. I have lived all my life in two worlds. I was born of an English mother and an Indian father in the years following World War II. That makes me a person of mixed blood by today's Can Canadian norm. Using yesterday's, I would have been called a half-breed. Colonial legislation, even until present day, prescribes who is an Indian and who is not. This external determination of identity only serves to confuse and frustrate. Understanding this and the importance of identity to the cultural continuity of our people provides me both personally and professionally with the motivation to question how we are in the world. The early 1950s were times of change for Indian peoples in Canada. Service by Indian men and women in the military had raised awareness in all, in all Canadians of the plight of Indian peoples in Canadian society. Major changes to the Indian Act occurred. Indian people were once again allowed to practice their rites and ceremonies, such as the potlatches in, of the BC peoples and the sun dances of the prairie peoples. They could now go into professions, religious orders, and participate in higher education without loss of status. This was the decade of my birth. I go on to tell Aaron um, many more things, and so I'm going to skip that, but I want to share these last um, paragraphs with you. As an adult, so we skipped all those growing years and all of that. So as an adult, I have been given the opportunity to reconnect myself with the teachings of my grandfather and my father through the teachings of elders and others. I recall my first visit to a Cree reserve in Saskatchewan, where I was to spend the better part of five years in the communities. I still remember that feeling of being home. It was almost like deja vu, a sense of having been there before, but not that exact location. The people joked and teased and laughed the way my father and my grandfather had. There was a feeling of caring and belonging. This is where I met Louis, a Cree elder, with whom I worked developing an early childhood education program for his community and eight other nations comprising the Metal Lake Tribal Council. I will never forget the first time I met Louis. We were at the first meeting of community members. 
And I had come with the academics because at that time I was doing my master's at UVic, University of Victoria. <clears throat> And we were all sitting together, and we were all to discuss the development of the child care program that was going to occur in the communities. I did a, my presentation from a very factual place. So I had read all of these good papers, and I did this presentation. I didn't know how little I knew then. I remember Louis coming to me afterwards and saying, you must speak about those things that you have experienced. I had not spoken from my personal experience, but instead from an academic review of literature that really I had not experienced. That presentation had been so out of place, and I will never forget the feeling and awareness of not knowing. I knew what that was like. Later after the meeting, it was my friend Mary Rose, a community member, who introduced me to Louis, who told me, Louis has chosen to teach you. I spent many, many years with this elder teacher. As my relationship deepened with Louis over the years, he taught me a lot of things. He was my teacher and I was his student. One activity we undertook together was to develop a book of elders' reflections on childhood as a way of caring for our children in the communities. We spent a lot of time doing that memory work in our communities. As we visited with the elders, he taught me the protocols of being with elders, of showing respect. I also learned the importance of meeting face-to-face -face with people. We sometimes would travel three hours for a one-hour visit, three hours one way to have that one hour visit, but it was important. During these drives, Louis would tell me the stories of the people and of the land, where the families were from and the differences between communities and nations. He taught me how to read the land and about the medicines he gave. Well, shortly after my time, my direct time with him in five years, I moved, um, I finished my master's at UVic and I moved uh, to the Okanagan Valley. Uh, for a job, and I remember him telling me, and I had met an elder there, Elder Mary Thomas, who was a Sowetma elder, um, and he, I remember him saying, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to move. It's time for you to learn from her. It was um, soon after that, after I... Um, had moved and I had a relationship with Mary that Louis passed. But I'm not sure there's a day that goes by that I don't remember the things that he taught me or I don't live those in my very being. Mary Thomas and I taught together for two years on her home reserve in the Swetma territory. She taught me about the culture and all about her land and her stories and the people. It was during these early years together that she asked me to write down her stories that, so they would not be lost. She wanted to preserve her teachings. She wanted to leave them for others to learn from. I documented her words for over 12 years, her stories for her. So her family has them and they share them in their um, community, nation, uh, learning facilities and institutions. My years with her taught me a lot and I hold those teachings in my heart, in my memory, and in my being. I have been blessed to have so many teachers in my life. Sometimes I think they were given to me to carry on what my grandfather and my father taught me in my childhood. When I think of it now, I have been gathering up beads of learning my whole life. As I gather these teachings, I sew them together with my experiences so that most importantly, Aaron, you will know your place and your connection in this world. I would suspect that everybody, or I would know that everybody in this room could
could write a similar story of your own journey. I was grateful for the opportunity to reflect back on that because it reminded me. It reminded me of the importance of relationships. It reminded me the importance of my children, my family, my community. So let's move into this. Did we lose it? Sorry. Did we lose? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just a little pause there. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk in, the, in this presentation. I will touch on some of the things that I read to you um, from my dissertation, but I, I want to talk a bit about a look to the past, some of Indigenous knowing. So that has to do with some of our philosophies, and it really does set the context. I've um, had a lot of students in my lifetime, and I've been a student, and I will remain a student for the rest of my days. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is if we really want people to understand and to know, we really do have to take the time to tell our stories, to really reflect back on, um, on our own knowledges and where we, where we situate ourselves. So there's a couple of slides about that. Um, and then I'm going to talk more specifically about early childhood programs and give you a glimpse of how early childhood has developed over time and where we are at today. And then early childhood, the final uh, group of slides, really looks at early childhood as a determinant of health and well-being. And I use that term health in its most broad sense. It's all those things that impact our lives. So it's not just the health, medical health care system. I'm not talking about health like that. I'm talking about holistic health and all of those things that make us healthy individuals. <laughs> That's a little grizzly bear, isn't he sweet? <laughs> so a bit about indigenous worldviews. I'm not going to read these slides to you. I know that you're quite capable of doing that yourselves. So, but I do want to say that indigenous philosophies are anchored in interrelationships among the spiritual, the natural, so nature, and the self. These relationships form the foundations or beginnings of indigenous ways of knowing and being. All things are imbued with spirit, and we are in relationship with all that surrounds us. You live this every day. This is nothing new to you. This is an affirmation of what you live and be every day. Greg Cahady, a Pueblo scholar, he describes indigenous people's relationships with the land as embodying a theology of place, a reflection and sacred orientation to place and space. So our relationships with the land are sacred relationships and special relationships. He explains that we come to a spiritual understanding through the intimate relationship people establish with place and the environment with all things that make or give them life. Sometimes we don't think about those things. When we're in our jobs and we're, and we're practicing and, and teaching and, all of, and caregiving, sometimes we don't think about, so where am I anchored in that and where does that come from? Another Pueblo elder said the land has become an extension of Indian thought and being because um, it holds the memories and the bones of our people. This is the place that made us. That's why we see so much importance around genealogy and our relationships to one another and the words that we use to dis define and describe those relationships. From that sort of indigenous, holistic, relational worldview, there are some very specific beliefs about children, and this isn't all of them. This is a few that I've heard over the years as I've worked with different colleagues from across the country, and you can see them there. 
The Mi'kmaq believe that from the time a child is conceived, there is an acceptance that the child's spirit has been conceived. There is no notion of tabula rasa or blank slate upon which to build. Instead, each person has a unique spirit that is predetermined before his or her body grows into it. I heard you speak of some of these things, uh, some of our speakers already this morning. Indigenous beliefs anchored in distinct Indigenous knowledge direct adults and others to interact with children in certain ways that may differ from those that might arise from different belief systems. Many Indigenous beliefs lead to learning, learning that is about coming to know the self, realizing the relationship of the spirit and the self to the world not just creating the self through learning. Learning plays a significant role in children realizing the gifts they are born with, and I think somebody spoke about this earlier. Marie Baptiste says that knowledge is not secular, it's a process der derived from creation, and as such, it has a sacred purpose. It is inherent in and connected to all of nature, to its creatures and to its existence, human existence. Learning in this context is a lifelong responsibility that people employ to understand the world and to realize their personal gifts or abilities. The process of recognizing and affirming one's gifts or talents is the essence of learning. Failure is when a person refuses to follow his or her gifts or understanding. Those are strong beliefs. Related to learning is teaching or pedagogy. Who's teaching and how does teaching occur? It's an integral part of children's growth and development. You are a part every day of children's growth and development. How you are in relationship with those children, how you teach, you are a part of their growth and development. Caring, the value of caring is the source from which all teaching arises. So one of our most sacred natural laws from where I come from is caring. Caring is a fundamental value that describes a way of living within the flux and energies of indigenous worldviews and relationships. So knowing that what we do every day comes from a deep sense of belief and caring. And I think those are really important. That caring begins in the family for children. They are first found within the circle of the family. It is from this place that children learn. I think when we think about our current realities of child welfare reform and all those things that are going on, for me, this underscores the importance of supporting our families. And I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. I look at the traditional care of children briefly here. The task of society, any society, the societies of our communities, broader Canadian society, is to prepare its children to take their place in the world of adults, in its broadest sense, the transmission of culture. In our traditional societies, and this is just a couple of examples that I have uh, come across, um, the conditions in traditional Aboriginal life provided the conditions for solid childhood foundation. Babies and toddlers spent their first years within the extended family where parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters all shared the responsibility for protecting and nurturing them. Children were allowed to grow and develop with little interference. They were, allowed, they were encouraged to be autonomous and to be critically thinking about their environment. 
They learned how to interpret the world. They learned the primacy of relationship over material possessions. They discovered that they had special gifts that would define their place in and contribution to the family and community. So the children were in the heart of the collective and could seen as contributing members of that collective. Mary Thomas, um, I think I have a photo of her so you'll see her. She also talked about, um, she talked a lot about um, what life was like uh, when she was young. And she would tell me in the winter, everyone stayed in and prepared their tools, weaved their baskets, and got ready for the next season of food gathering. Winter was also a time of storytelling. So th these were the school months for children. So we're beginning to see how important story was, how important um, relationships were. When the children watched the elders doing the activities in the spring and summer, they had already heard the stories about it. Like making baskets, they knew what the basket was for, how it was made, and how to use it. So to me, that really speaks to the powers of observation and how do we allow that in the kinds of work that we are doing today. Uh, I'm going to talk more about actually applying some of this. But I think families teach and enable children to learn and understand a culture's shared values, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. It is about the survival of the culture, collectively, and about the health and development of children individually. A child's development of self and group identity and esteem is the start of a path to independence and self-sufficiency. So we are all driving to self-determination to be determining over our own lives, over our children, over our health, over our education. We need these healthy children anchored in their ways of knowing and being. I wanna switch um, now from that because I have, to, I have to reiterate once again that I think all of you probably in this room live those values every day. It's whether we take the time to say, this is what it is. We just do. So when we're teaching a little group of children or we're caring for a group, do we ask ourselves, what is it that I'm really doing? What, what am I teaching here? How am I showing this respect? How am I ensuring that those values that are, are, are very being are being taught and passed on? That, that's sometimes hard to do outside of family, outside of community when we're in formalized programs. How do you do that in a classroom? I mean, those are big questions and they um, merit great discussion. I want to talk about early childhood now um, and, and sort of revisit where we've been in this country. I've been around long enough to have been through a few decades of development of early childhood programs, so I'm just going to share some of that with you now to give you a sense of where we've been and where we're going with um, what I see happening in this country in early childhood. So let's take a look at this first. Here's a whole whack of definitions. It doesn't matter what arena I'm in. People are, are using different terms, and yet we talk about, we're talking about young children, prenatal to six years old, but depending if I'm in with a bunch of health professionals or I'm with teachers, they have different words, and yet sometimes, you know, they're talking about the same period of life. So there you go. There you see it there, early childhood. Some people say birth to eight. Some people say birth to 12. Some people say birth until they're ready to go to formal education. So, you know, I've been in lots of discussions like that. Um, early childhood development. So there we have that, that concept of holistic development, that it isn't just cognitive and it isn't just our physical development, but it's all of the other things. And I don't need to tell any of you in the room about that. I'm sure you all know. Um, 
or ECE, ECCE, Early Childhood Care and Education, a stage to prepare, to prepare for formal education. Early childhood, uh, and then we've got preschool, early childhood education, um, a branch of education theory. I don't know if that's how you define it here in the province of Manitoba, but it would be great to, to know that. And I'm sure you could probably add words to this. So I show this slide to say, so what is it that we're really talking about? Because I think what this does is it shows that early childhood just doesn't live in education or just doesn't live in health or child welfare or any of those things. It's like measuring the human condition. How do you do that? It's all those things come to bear on children. And it comes to bear through our relationships. There she is. There is Mary Thomas, the lady I've been talking about, the elder, one of my elder teachers. Lovely, lovely woman. So I put up a timeline here just to give us a bit of a sense of, of where we've been in pre-1980s, probably around the 60s and 70s, we started to see um, the K4, K5 programs begin to develop across the country and in provinces and territories around um, preschool programs on reserve for children. There's not a lot uh, written on that history. I remember uh, some years ago I tried to find out a lot about that. You may, that may be a good project for someone to take on in your province. When did they start and did everybody get them? Were they universal? My understanding is nationally they certainly weren't universal. There were people who started, had them, some provinces and territories long before others. And I remember it was very tied to the women, um, to the women's circles, um, and to the Native Women's Association were very active in advocating for young children back in those early days, and still are. 1980s, you had a whole bunch of things going on there. There was nothing really Indigenous specific except the Child Care Initiatives Fund. I don't know if any of you remember that, but that was a number of years ago. And they actually did, they didn't fund core funding for child care, and I'm talking child care right now, but they did some pilot programs on reserve, a few across the country. That was it. Until then, we did not have um, child care, Head Start, any of those kinds of services on reserve. Then the 1990s came and things really um, changed. There was a lot of activity in the 90s. You saw the Child Care Initiative in 95. Um, the um, Urban and Northern Head Start also came out in 1995. If, if any of you are teachers in that, you will know all that uh, history. And then the on-reserve component of that came out in 1998. So there was lots of activity um, going on. And there was started to begin, you know, people were advocating for the need. And I'll just share one little story with you. I was part of the development of the First Nations Inuit Child Care Initiative. And I was also part of the Head Start once nationally when we were doing this. And there was a lot of nat national consultations across the country. And your very own Sheila Murdoch was part of that too, Sheila. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, that's how we first met. It was way back in 1995. Um, I remember we were hosting um, a consultation and people would come from all over the place. And I was sitting in Ontario and I, <clears throat> Mary had come with me to this meeting because she would fly with me when I was doing this work. And I was there with the rest of the committee. It wasn't just me, there was a whole group uh, from across the country. And so we were hosting and I remember I was in a circle and there was an, an, an older woman from uh, Ontario And she asked me this question. She said, Margo, are we not putting, with this initiative, are we not putting residential schools in the hearts of our communities for those younger than I was when I went? Wow. That made my heart uh, stop. I think 
I don't recall our response. We were in circle, and I know um, we talked about it. But one of the things that I do know, I have never forgotten that question. I never forget that question when I'm invited to a lot of these arenas to give advice or talk to or whatever. I never forget that question. And that is one of the reasons that I will always talk about our ways of knowing and being. Our ways. Because that is so absolutely fundamental. And I know sometimes people think, oh, Margo, you're just, no, no. Because that question tells me, how do I ensure that the children that I am teaching, that I am caring for, are going to know who they are, who they are as an Indigenous person, as a community member, every day. Yeah, I think about that. I actually wrote my master's thesis uh, around that question, um, and I carried that forward into my dissertation. There's a piece on that as well, where I tell that story. In the 2000s, it was uh, kind of exciting, but not a lot happened uh, for early childhood programs and services on reserve. Not a, not a lot was going on. We saw... Um, Early childhood, uh, an early childhood development initiative, uh, but that was for non-Indigenous society. We saw Aboriginal early childhood development. There was multilateral frameworks. There was all kinds of things. Do you remember the ELCC funds and quad principles? Federal government went down this road around, um, let's uh, roll everything together and we'll have these principles of quality, universal, universally inclusive, accessible, and developmental. Single window. Didn't go anywhere. Kind of just died on the vine. We were going down one road and there was all sorts of promises and then it didn't, wasn't able to go anywhere. So we did a lot of work in our communities and a lot of thinking about it and it just didn't come to life. We did see some maternal child health in 2005, and then, of course, we were into the Kelowna Accord. We had um, conservative government. We had some child tax benefit reconfiguration. And now, in 2016, we had the uh, announcement of early learning and child care. Where did I put that? Oh. So early learning and childcare is, um, and was, it was announced in 2016, and then, um, uh, hmm. I'm trying to think where I put that. Oh. In 2016, the Prime Minister had asked the Minister of Families, Children, and Social Development, so ESDC, Minister Duclos, and the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs, who was Minister Carolyn Bennett at the time. You know that that's been split, but at the time. And they were asked uh, to collaborate. They were to collaborate um, with Indigenous peoples, provinces, and territories in developing an Indigenous ELCC framework as a first step towards delivering affordable, high quality, flexible, and fully inclusive childcare. So a bit of a glimpse of the quad principles there again. That is currently unfolding. There has been a policy framework um, developed and it is currently unfolding. We don't know what that'll look like in the regions, so I mean the provinces and territories, we do not know what that will look like in the communities yet. But stay tuned for that because that is unfolding. And it's the first time that there's really been, I think, fairly good consultation, I hate that word consultation, engagement with is a much better word in these kinds of initiatives. Um, 
I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I think it's a step forward from what I've seen 10 and 20 years ago. I want to talk just a bit about contemporary realities. I'm not going to go into any detail on this. Um, we are in a time, and all of these have an influence on what it is and how we are caring for our children and what latitude and scope that we have. So we are in a time of the Royal Commission had its 20th anniversary. We are in a time of truth and reconciliation, and I know that many of you have, uh, are aware of that, uh, particularly Article 12, when we're thinking our uh, call to action 12, uh, when we're thinking about early childhood, new liberal government, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People has now been fully ratified by Canada. We know there's the Human Rights Tribunal you in Manitoba most certainly know about that. The attention given to the 60 scoop, child welfare reform, Indian hospitals. So more and more are we hearing people come forward and talking about the issues and the results, if you will, of colonial experience. So that leaves us in early childhood in a very complex reality. We all want good things for our kids. Indigenous children learn to walk in multiple worlds. That's fact. It isn't just one way or another. They have to learn different skill sets. And I think that's a really important consideration when we're preparing curriculum, when we're teaching. Identity formation is paramount in the learning for Indigenous children. Attachment to people and to the land, language and culture. We see this written in many documents. We hear it talked about. Relationships with family and community. Children's homes are a place of learning and intervention. I have often thought about this. I know that people use the term the child at the center. But the child does not exist unto themselves. They exist within the context of family and the context of community, however that's defined. And I think that's really important as we look forward in caring for our kids. How are we bringing those families with us? How are we supporting moms and dads? and parents, grandparents. Federal actions affect Indigenous people. So all of these things that I've just talked about, they all impact us. In one way or the other, they do impact us. So it's important that we know about that. Our goals have always been to be self-determining and self-sufficient. I've never heard in across this land Anybody that would say to me, well, we don't, want to, we don't want to be that. It's always about being self-determining over ourselves. Here's one of the things that I find most interesting right now in this time. I see all kinds of child welfare reform going on. I was just at the emergency child welfare meeting a couple of weeks ago in Ottawa. I, and, you know, people are talking about the importance of family and the importance of early childhood and how we prevent, how we protect our children from going into that system. And people are talking about early childhood and the importance of children and families. I was in a meeting with educators. They, too, are talking about the optimal education of young children. Health. We talk about the health and well-being of our children in all of its broadest sense. And my last slides, which are next, are going to be about health. But I see these disciplines. I see these separate sectors. Our challenge is going to be to work together in relationship 
because we're talking about the same children. We probably have the same end goal of healthy, happy, safe, high-functioning children, right? Who are going to be citizens of our communities, citizens of our nations. Our challenge will be to get past some of those, to be able to work together to that common end. And I think in this organization that you have already is moving in that um, direction, certainly. In terms of quality, I'll just, I'm not going to go over this slide. These, um, these are, are some ideas of quality, um, early childhood programs. It doesn't matter if it's health. It doesn't matter if it's education. It doesn't matter. I think those are really important considerations. And those were garnered from conversations of community members across the country. Most of these you already know. You're already doing it. I want to show you two slides on early childhood as a determinant of health. I'll tell you why I like uh, health and determinants of health is because it's m more closely aligned with holistic well-being than anything else I've seen. It talks about, other than our own, our own metaphors, I have to qualify that. This talks about all those things that impact our lives and our children's lives. So how much food we can provide to a children might depend, in my case, I was a single parent for a lot of years. It depended on the kind of job I had. Did I have enough, you know, could I make enough money to pay the rent and put good food on the table? In part, that depended on how much education. So I, when I started out, I had a one-year certificate in ECE, and I taught in daycares. That's how I started, way back when. And so, you know, as I could get more education, I got, you know, I could get better jobs, blah, blah, you know. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, like they're all, all of those things influence our children's lives, either directly or indirectly. Is there a childcare setting that my, is there a preschool that my son could go to? Or what kind of center was he attending? Those were really important. That's why I like this determinants of health model because it talks about education, it talks about gender, it talks about poverty. It talks about all of those things that impact us every day of our lives. We might not consciously think about it all the time, but all those things do. Yeah, many of the days of craft dinner, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> in, this, uh, in this model as well, there are unique determinants to indigenous people. And you'll see them listed on the side there, Col colonization, racism, marginalization, dislocation, social exclusion, um, self-determination, self-reliance. Those are unique to us and our realities. If we want to create change, and I often am in arenas where we're talking about change. If we want to change the lives of our children and families, our most vulnerable, then what is it we need to do? We need to have change at multiple levels. So when we have government here, we need to talk about that. Our leadership needs to talk about that. What is the structural changes that need to happen? What are the systemic changes? How do we change our organizations? So that if I walk into your organization, I can see those values, those values of caring, of sharing, of love. We never talk about love, and we should. Because we do love. And service delivery change, when we're on the ground, when we're actually caring for that child, when I am in relationship with that child in my classroom, how am I? What am I doing? In this um, configuration, 
The structural change and the systemic change is meant to enable. All it is meant to do is to support what happens on the ground. It is not the goal itself. The goal itself is healthy children and families and parents and young people, all of them. That's the goal. And that happens on the ground. The other pieces are only meant to enable it to happen. My last slide. Last two slides. Wow, look at all the text on here. And I could have written pages on this, and I would challenge you to do the same for you in each of your organizations, in each of the areas that you work. These are just some, I was thinking about early childhood, and here's some examples of structural change, of systemic change. So for example, you agree to a new relationship with First Nations. Governments agree to new relationships with First Nations, with Métis peoples, Inuit peoples. And it's an equitable, equal relationship. Regulatory mechanisms, I don't even want to go down that path because that's a long journey when we talk about that and what happens in the centers and, and our uh, classrooms. Systemic change. It'd be great to see increased number of Indigenous teachers and employees. I am thrilled to be in this room with you today <laughs> to see so many caregivers, so many teachers, so many professionals. It's amazing. I'm not sure I see the same at home in BC. Quality care and education for children. Have we developed a statement that can hold us accountable, that can hold governments accountable, that is transparent, and we know where we're all going? Accreditation standards and processes so that our, our elders, our community knowledge keepers can be in our programs, and they're not they're, not, they're considered equal, not second to any teacher. That's honoring our knowledge. That's called privileging our voice and privileging our knowledge. And that's really important. Individual change. And this is where it happens on the ground. This is all the kinds of things that you already know and you're already doing. I see in this resource center, you are doing so much of this already. It's amazing. And I'm so grateful to see it and to hear about it. Professional development that's focused on Indigenous people. I've been to some early childhood programs. I know in British Columbia, I think I've been the lone voice. I feel like a one snowflake in a snowstorm. For 20 years, I've asked early childhood programs, please include one course on Indigenous children and peoples. I'm still the one snowflake in the snowstorm, but I'm hopeful. I don't stop. I don't quit. You know, those, those post-secondary education institutions across the sectors, health, education, um, social work, all of them need to be focusing. And they need to engage with community to bring in that knowledge because it rests with you. It really rests with you and your community and your knowledge keepers. And I guess the last point I want to make of this presentation is culturally respectful teaching practice. I know that in health, we often talk about culturally safe service delivery. I challenge us to think about what is culturally safe teaching. I don't know the answers, but I'll bet you do. That's why it's, um, I am always grateful to have the opportunity to be in these kinds of rooms, to maybe get a chance to talk to some of you to hear your stories as well. Because I think that is a really important place to start to explore. I want to leave you with this last quote. Grandfather, what is the purpose of life? 
After a long time in thought, the old man replied, Grandson, children of the per are the purpose of life. We were once children, and someone cared for us. Now it is our time to care. I thank you for all of the work that you do on behalf of our children and our families. Miigwech.